Welcome back, health psych learners. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of pain and its management. Pain is not just a physical sensation, but a comprehensive experience that encompasses our physical, emotional, and behavioral responses. And so in this video, we'll focus on clinical pain, which requires medical attention. So let's explore the intricacies of pain and discover effective strategies for managing it. Pain comes in various forms and durations. We categorize it as acute, recurrent, or chronic based on its duration. Acute pain is short-term and typically results from an injury or an illness. Recurrent pain may come and go over time, while chronic pain persists for extended periods, often lasting beyond the expected healing time. However, pain's subjective nature makes it challenging to develop objective psychophysiological measures. Clinicians re rely on behavioral measures, visual and rating scales, and standardized pain inventories to assess and understand pain. Pain begins when nerve endings in the skin are stimulated. The messages travel through nerve fibers, signaling acute pain or slow burning pain. Within our brain, endorphins and encephalins act as neurotransmitters, inhibiting pain by targeting specific regions like the substantia gelatinosa of the spinal cord and the periaqueductal gray region. Additionally, the dorsal anterior cingular cortex plays a role in the cognitive modulation of pain. Genetic research suggests that the, pain experience, the experience of pain has a heritable component. According to the gate control theory, a pain gate in the spinal cord can be closed through a stimulation of the fast pain fiber system or the descending neural pathways to the brain. That's the gate control theory by Melzack and Wall. It acts as like a gate control system. If pain is enough, then you'll feel it. If the pain is not a lot, then you probably won't feel it in the same way as if it was a lot of pain. Psychosocial factors play significant in our experience of pain. While older individuals and women tend to report higher pain levels, the relationship between pain, gender, and aging is really complex. It's not as simple as what I just said. Cultural and ethnic differences in pain perception have been reported, but interpreting cross-cultural studies can be challenging. Researchers have struggled to identify a pain-prone personality, although chronic pain patients often exhibit elevated scores on certain psychological scales. Additionally, psychosocioeconomic uh, status is associated with more frequent reports of musculoskeletal pain, higher pain intensity, and physical disability. The challenges faced by individuals with low SES make them more vulnerable to the detrimental effects on stress, health, and functioning. Now, how do we treat pain? Well, most pain is treated through the use of the biomedical approach, which revolves around the use of analgesic drugs such as opioids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Other modalities include trans transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, stimulation-produced analgesia, and physical therapy, and occasionally surgery. However, in contemporary practice, surgery is rarely used as a primary pain management option. Here's my favorite, though. Swearing as a distraction method serves various purposes. So let's focus on Stevens et al. 2009 and what they did to see how pain was experienced through the use of swearing. People may swear to release pent-up emotion, shock, or insult others, or simply out of habit. It can be cathartic, providing a sense of relief in distressing situations like giving birth or accidentally hitting your thumb with a hammer. In some cases, swearing can be a symptom of disinhibition, resulting from frontal lobe syndrome, where individuals exhibit impulsive and inappropriate behaviors, including profanity. Interestingly, some pain theorists speculate that swearing may be a form of pain-related catastrophizing, an unhelpful response when negative and distressing thoughts are amplified during a painful experience. 
However, there's limited scientific evidence to support this viewpoint. Nonetheless, the prevalence of swearing as a response to pain raises questions about its role and potential effects. To investigate, researchers, Stevens et al., conducted this experiment. Their hypothesis was that swearing, considered a maladaptive response to pain, would decrease pain tolerance and increase pain perception compared to not swearing. So that, again, was that as a maladaptive response to pain would decrease pain tolerance. So you would not be able to tolerate more pain and then you would increase the amount of pain that you feel. That's what their thought was. So participants in the study were asked to provide five words they would use after hitting their thumb with a hammer with the first swear word on the list being used. As a control, they were asked for five words to describe a table using the word corresponding to the position of the swear word. Then they used a cold presser paradigm. Nobody slammed their thumb with a hammer. That would be really bad and irreversible, right? If you accidentally broke a thumb. So in this case, they used what is called a cold presser where participants submerged one hand and a little bit of their far, uh, forearm into ice-cold water. And we're talking down to about 5 degrees Celsius or, you know, somewhere around 40 degrees Fahrenheit until discomfort compelled them to remove it. Of course, so time was one thing they measured. The time it took for them to remove their hand served as an index of pain tolerance much like you would test if you were to put your hand down on something hot, how quickly does that pain reflex get your hand off that stove? Intriguingly, the results of the experiment revealed unexpected findings. Contrary to the assumption that swearing is a maladaptive response to pain, the study found that participants who repeated a swear word endured a painful stimulus significantly longer. So when they had their hand down into the water, they just repeated the pain the, the pain word. At one point, it was the swear word, and at the other point, it was the control word. They did it both, right? So here are their findings, okay? Here are their findings on this graph. Study found that participants who repeated a swear word endured a painful stimulus significantly longer than those who used a non-swear word, okay? Swearing not only increased pain tolerance, but it also reduced perceived pain. Additionally, though, and this is the, the real treat about this, participants' heart rate increase after swearing, suggesting an activation of the fight-or-flight response. And we talked about the fight-or-flight response in a previous video. The study also explored sex differences in the hypoalgesic effect of swearing. While both men and women experienced decreased pain tolerance when catastrophizing increased swearing, the hypoalgesic effect of swearing persisted in women regardless of their tendency to catastrophize. This difference is yet to be fully understood, but it may be related to the frequency of swearing, with men generally swearing more often than women. Emotions play a specific role in the hypoalgesic effect of swearing as well. Swearing is thought to tap into deep emotional regions of the brain, such as the limbic system and the basal ganglia. The study suggests that swearing induces a negative emotion akin to immediate alarm reaction, possibly aggression. This emotion response, accompanied by an increase in heart rate, aligns with the fight-or-flight response and may contribute to pain tolerance. In other words, when your heart rate goes up, your blood travels all over your body so much faster, and this then can help with the pain response to alleviate it or at least give your brain the necessary information to counteract the gate being open. While the relationship between aggression and pain tolerance has been examined in the reverse, so that is increasing pain tolerance leading to more aggression, with higher pain tolerance predicting increased aggression, the effect of manipulating aggression levels on pain tolerance remains unexplored. So future research is really looking for this other direction of 
aggression to pain tolerance. And it's important to note that throughout the experiment, researchers measured patients, uh, patients, excuse me, participants' heart rate to assess autonomic arousal and pain perception as additional pain variables, so self-report measures. And this allowed them to uh, rule out catastrophizing, a fear of pain, and then things like trade anxiety, doing new things and things like that, which could influence pain outcomes. So they were able, their statistical techniques were able to remove all of that added variation in each person, okay? All right, so we're gonna finish here. The most successful pain treatment programs adopt a multidisciplinary approach, combining analgesic medications with individual cognitive behavioral modalities. This comprehensive approach ensures that physical, emotional, and psychological aspects of pain are addressed holistically. And that concludes our exploration of pain and its management. Remember, pain is a complex phenomenon, and effective treatment requires this complex understanding that I mentioned. By integrating biomedical approaches with psychosocial interventions, we can help individuals regain control over their lives and experience relief from chronic pain. Thank you for joining us today. And remember, knowledge is power. See you in the next video. And swear away when you stub that toe.